So now that we've looked at some key moments in development specifically relating to gastrulation in different organisms, we're now going to focus our efforts on gastrulation specifically within humans. And so now we're going to entitle this next flowchart Human Gastrulation 1. So again, the majority of gastrulation, whenever you're studying this developmental process, the end results are pretty much the same, but it's the routes and the mechanisms needed to get to that end result of three germ layers, let's say, that's going to be different between and within species sometimes. So now, let's look at human gastrulation. Overall, let's, let's first understand what happens and what is the result of cleavage. So at the end of cleavage, of, in humans specifically, what do we have? We have something known as the blastocyst. So terminology is important here when you're talking about human development. No longer are we going to refer to this initial structure as the blastula, but in humans it's explicitly referred to as the blastocyst. So we're going to state that there's going to be a blastocyst formation at the end of cleavage. So we have fertilization, sperm meets egg, we have cleavage, growth, with, we have cell division without growth for a great amount of time, and now we're having this blastocyst as the end result. Overall, like I said before, a blastocyst is generally just referred to as the mammalian blastula. It's sort of a differentiating term from mammalian and non-mammalian blastula. So now, the blastocyst is also going to be, like I just said, the result of fertilization. It's the result of both fertilization and cleavage that has occurred prior, and that's going to be all within the oviduct. Location is important when we're talking about human developmental processes, because we have different developmental processes that are occurring in different parts within an internal structure now, and that's the female. The female anatomy has internal structure, like the oviduct, that's going to allow for fertilization and cleavage, but gastrulation is going to have a little bit of a different route, as we'll see. And also in terms of time scale, we're now looking at something that has been formed as a result of six days of work. It's six days after sperm meets egg and does the fertilization event. Do we have a blastocyst? And the blastocyst, upon its development and creation, will be then sort of moving and transporting itself to the uterus because the uterus is going to be the site of implantation where we have to put this embryo and we have to develop it for many different reasons, as we'll see. The uterus is going to be the home of that development. We've been thickening it with the endometrium thickening for a long time. It's worthy of using, so let's get to there um, from this process. So now, let's look at the blastocyst and its result and specific mechanisms associated with gastrulation. So, generally speaking, a blastocyst it's going to be a structure that's uh, about 100 cells. It doesn't necessarily have to be 128 like the blastula um, requirement. It's about 100 cells, and it's going to be just like the blastula arranged around a central cavity. Around a central cavity. So that central cavity is going to be the blastocele. So this basic structure that's of importance to us is to understand um, what's going to be happening during gastrulation. So we need a structural understanding of the blastocyst to understand the mechanistic understanding and outcomes of gastrulation. Now, we know that the blastocele, we'll just get this out of the way, it's still termed the blastocele, even though it's the blastocyst now. This is just the hollow area, the central cavity that we have of this growing blastocyst, this developing blastocyst. But there are two other areas of interest that we need to go over. There's going to be an area called the trophoblast. Trophoblast. That's a part of the blastocyst in human gastrulation that's going to be important. The trophoblast, from a definition standpoint, is an outer single layer of cells on this structure. Single layer of cells, and that's going to be the trophoblast. Now, what we're going to state is that when these cells, the trophoblastic cells, contact the structure that they're supposed to reach, the uterus, but specifically, it's termed the uterine lining, we're going to have very important downstream events. Specifically, at, at first, these cells will secrete enzymes. 
they will secrete enzymes. So this secretion event happens upon contact with the uterine lining. Okay, what is the purpose of secreting enzymes at a uterus right now, at the uterine lining? Well, this is because this trophoblastic region of the blastocyst is going to have these enzymes being secreted in order to break down the endometrium. It actually breaks down um, a small area of the endometrium, not a lot, a very small area of the endometrium because we're talking about trying to implant a very small thing, about 100 cells. It's not very big at all. So we're breaking down a small area where we can possibly implant ourselves into the endometrium. So again, we can reiterate that this idea of breaking down this portion of the endometrium isn't in, in an attempt or allowing for penetration. It allows for this overall blastocyst structure to penetrate um, and penetrate into the embryo, okay? Allows for penetration uh, by the embryo. Not into the embryo, I should say, by the embryo. It's because the embryo is the blastocyst because it's the dividing structure, growing structure. It has to penetrate and implant itself into the endometrium. This is how it's gonna do it, utilizing this trophoblast structure within the blastocyst. Now, what's gonna happen after the penetration? After the penetration, the outer layer of this structure thickens, outer layer thickens, and it extends these projections. It increases its surface area, in other words. It's extending these projections from it. So you have this implantation, this penetration that has occurred. Now you get this thickening of the outer layer that's already on the outside of the trophoblast, and it's extending these projections, I should say. Projections. There we go. Now, what are they going to do? These finger-like projections, finger-like projections coming from the trophoblastic origin, the are going to allow for true implantation. This is the first time we're going to explicitly write this term now. Allow for implantation. These finger-like projections will allow for the implantation of the embryo because they're going to extend themselves and they're going to really make sure that the embryo is anchored so they act as an anchor so we'll say it anchors embryo the finger-like projections and one more thing in addition to anchoring the embryo it allows for the embryo in other words to be securely fastened to the area it needs to be in and that is the endometrium why does it need to be in the endometrium? Well, you've spent an entire cycle, in terms of the female's perspective, thickening this structure, the endometrium, the inner part of the uterus, in hopes for, in hopes for and in preparation for a possible implantation by a possible fertilized egg. And that's exactly what's happening here, all thanks to trophoblastic functions as a part of the blastocyst structure, okay? So it's all, we're basically making a big jump right now from oviduct to uterus, successfully utilizing trophoblast. And then finally, the last structure to understand about the blastocyst, besides this outer layer of cells, there's an inner layer of cells. There's an inner cell mass, I should say. That inner cell mass is going to specifically be a cluster of cells cluster of cells that become the embryo proper. So that's a term we've seen before and you should be familiar with, that become embryo proper. And if you remember, this is the actual structure that becomes the individual. This is the part of the embryo that develops into the IND, the individual that will be born. Um, and this is also going to be a very important point of research, actually. It's a source of many of the embryonic stem lines that are in research or used for research. So when you want embryonic stem cells or you hear that term, know that those embryonic stem cells are coming from a blastocyst, specifically the inner cell mass of a blastocyst, because the inner cell mass contains the embryo proper, which is and will become the individual. Thus, they're very much embryonic stem cells capable of de developing into many different possible organs or systems or cells at whatever level you're looking at. So that covers our first look at human gastrulation basic overview of structure. Now what we're going to be doing in the next video is looking more specifically at some events that occur in the process.